uh, we said we'll start with our uh, cordial Lagrangian. No? So what we did so far, the classical part, and we were looking at the quantum part of the Lagrangian. We wrote the standard model Lagrangian as uh, a uh, a fermion. Gauge L Yukawa LSS symmetric breaking point. So, over the time, what we have seen is that uh, each of this part, like for example, formula part, is kind of satisfied by at the quantum level as current. Interactions current with, uh, which conserves there is chiral symmetry which conserves it. So all the corrections at the quantum level are proportional to the fermion masses themselves. Gauge interactions we looked at uh, the main thing essentially was the self-energy diagrams, and uh, we looked at uh, what we call. Uh, that pole. Here we forgot to mention one important result at the Z pole. I will come back to it again. Uh, uh, then we also looked at the Z to BB bar and so uh, partial fractions of the Z decays. Okay, these are all the things we have looked at. Here we looked at uh, CPM. And also the fact that uh, there are no flavor changing neutral currents at three level. So all corrections are at one loop again, it leads to a huge number of uh, mixings. The examples we have looked at was K0, K0 bar. It's not okay. okay, we didn't talk about CP variation, but anyway, it's not K. K0, K0 bar, which is essentially the time K, and similar things in V2. And here uh, in the standard model, one important result we also saw was uh, the Higgs stability. Post the discovery of the Higgs, okay, we looked at the stability of the Higgs. Uh, today, I think our class is clashing with the Smith's thesis colloquium. Stability post the discovery of the Higgs. Uh, then, what else did we look at? Uh, uh, we looked at the uh, metastable vacua, stable, unstable vacua. Of course, all these calculations are extremely detailed. There is a lot of progress recently in this direction. We didn't talk about that progress actually. There is a lot of progress. Uh, now there are no more analytical techniques which are coming up in this direction, so which we have not talked about. It. Okay, now I mentioned that I forgot to mention one important result. Uh, uh, here, in giving the partial bits of Z to BB bar, I think uh, because I was trying to cover a lot of information, the entire standard model within two three lectures today, there are a lot of information I Miss one point, which is called the invisible decay width of the Higgs, where uh, where the Z when Z is uh, invisible goes to mu bar. Okay, okay, Z decays to mu bar. So this is extracted from the experiment.
f is equal. At the z point, and uh, this is highly well measured. And this is the partial width, okay? And this is the p square. Okay? When you measure the, uh, the uh, uh, okay, this is not actually the, this is the actual partial width. Okay. Um, now what happens is, uh, if you fit this width with number of meter nodes, it fits very well plus somewhere in bar. Okay, with a very very high precision. So it tells you that the number of meter nodes you can have coming from the invisible decay width of the Z should be uh, gamma u or gamma z u corresponds to uh, three neutrinos, three, three generations of neutrinos, three generations of This is typically taken as a signature. That's why we have three generations of the standard model. We only have three generations of what uh, what and electrons in the standard model. As long as they are between, as long you cannot have any electronic generation which is less than 40 kg. In another way, it means tells you that no new electronic generation with the mass and new prime less than 40 kg. Why this limit comes? Because Z has a mass of 91 GB. Z has a mass of 91 GB. Okay. So this total could put some sign of many models including dark matter. Any bit like that, but more Literally, no more stuff like that. So, all this while, while I was recapping the standard model, uh, uh, any questions on the standard model so far? No? Any questions? Uh, I mean, all of you are experts, I think all of you are senior students. Right? Rajesh, you have any questions here? No. 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 Okay. So, uh, at the quantum level, I said the classical symmetry, uh, which we did look at, global symmetries do not hold. This is an extremely much abused word. Okay, anomalies are everywhere. Okay, in every part of physics, I think there are anomalies. But here we are talking about anomalies in quantum theory. In particular, we talk about chiral anomalies in standard. Why we are talking about this again? Our motivation is again purely in the context of DSL physics. Okay? Any new particle if you add randomly, which is charged under the standard molecular group, should cancel anomalies. If it doesn't cancel anomalies, okay, it will lead to problems. So what are these anomalies? Okay. At the simplest level, you can think 
that uh, symmetry uh, of the classical Lagrangian is broken at the quantum at the quantum so uh, the last time we talked about how do you check the symmetry invariance of classical symmetries and quantum symmetries we have talked about two distinguished things right Kunchi? So the classical symmetries are essentially uh, sim uh, symmetries like of the, uh, the uh, gauge symmetries are the classical symmetries. Then lepton numbers, baryon number. Then we talked about approximate symmetries like uh, global symmetries, like you know, uh, uh, what are flavor symmetries and so on, so essentially QCD symmetries and so on. So uh, what happens in the quantum? Uh, 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 at the, the gate symmetries, it's a local symmetry. And a local symmetry, local gate symmetry, right? It is valid at the classical level. The Lagrangian unit term is completely valid. So you can imagine that you in terms of, you can write t is equal to 0, it's bad. Okay. If you write it in a covariant integration, this is valid. So this one is the matter part of the current, which is this part. Now this should also be valid at the quantum level. So how do you check at the quantum level? There are several ways of looking at it, but at the quantum level, this should this conservation of the current should always be valid. This conservation of the current should always be valid. So this is how do you see it? I said there are quantities like water entities. Okay? There are quantities like water entities. Similar to water entities, there are something in non ability theory which you learned in your KM52 class. Slano is just like that. Slano Taylor entity. Slam or Tyler identities will no longer be valid at the quantum. This doesn't happen for all the currents. This doesn't happen for all the gauge currents, but only those gauge currents which have gamma family. Okay? Those currents which have at least one gamma family. So this we take one particular example. So this particular current is also called axial current. Now remember that I kept insisting a lot that the standard model, the weak interactions are parallel interactions. So it distinguishes left with respect to right. Now how does that distinguishing come? Because you introduce a gamma phi. So you always put a projection operator on this gamma phi and take out, separate out the electric particles and write a separate current for them. So okay. So this is best established in terms of uh, so whenever you put a gamma phi, you can write a current associated with that. So J mu gamma phi, okay, which is called the actual vector current. It turns out this current, this current is conserved classically 
at the classical Lagrangian level, when you write down the equations of motion and derive the uh, uh, curvature conservation laws, it's conserved. But at the quantum mechanical level, meaning when you do one loop calculations, okay, when you start doing quantum mechanical ways, in quantum theory, quantum mechanical is at one loop level, when H cross is not equal to zero. Okay, at the one loop level, this current is no longer valid. This current is no longer conserved. So the simplest example is to compute something for the, uh, for the triangle diagrams. Triangle diagrams. These are diagrams in which you have <coughs> gauge boson and three vertices. And fermion will now in the standard model, you have three gauge groups. it several times. It's not anomalous. So that means if you put a group gluons this current okay it's non anomalous. There is no anomaly associated with it. SU3 is SU3 pure SU3 gluon 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 is non anomalous even though the this for because essentially it's a vectorial theory. But imagine that one of these currents has a gamma phi quantity. Okay? The other two are vector, see, remember that these two are both chiral theories. U1 is also a chiral theory because it distinguishes left hypercharges compared to right hypercharges. Okay? Left hypercharges and right, right hypercharges are different, so U1 is also a chiral theory. So what happens is, if you have a diagram in which, say, imagine that you have one of these, okay, you have a u1 sitting here, essentially, and now you compute this diagram. Okay, this diagram will lead to a non-zero, it should, okay, will lead to a non-conservation of the current because it will be proportional to a gamma phi times some hypercharge sum, some Pa, Pb, say for example, coming from, let's take the simplest example, which comes, just say, SU2 here, SU2 here, and then we list all possible diagrams, which we will compare that. So this will be proportional to this particular combination, Pa, Pb, which again, essentially, you can write it in terms of trace delta AB, some more y hypercharges. So you will sum over all the hypercharges so that this contribution should cancel because the gamma phi contribution, the coefficient proportional sitting next to the gamma phi should cancel. In terms of the currents, you can do it in various ways. Actually, there is a lot of deep one of the theory associated with anomalies. Okay, okay. Let's do this. Uh, uh, let's look at this one. <coughs> if there is only one new one vertex. Essentially, this is what it comes out to be. So, some are all the hypercharges. Some are all the hypercharges. Y should cancel. So you take generation by generation and you check that this actually cancels. This actually goes to zero.
Why should it go to zero? Why it's called an anomaly? Q of T force for what? <laughs> why it's called an anomaly? Why should it go to zero? Why are these strict? Why? Because the theory plays a very bad part in the very famous paper studied by Jacquieu and Bross, who actually show, actually, these were discovered again by ABJ, Adler, Adler as in Gitimar's advisor, Bell as the same famous Bell and Jacquieu's ABJ anomalies. Later, uh, it was shown by Jack Cross and Sylvania in the famous paper, in which show, the, show that if a theory has an anomalous contribution, the theory is non anomalous Why it is non anomalous Why? Because again, this current will be proportional to this quantum at the quantum level. So this current at the quantum level, I'm using this as the quantum arm, <coughs> is typically called an anomaly function. A uh, Uh, depending upon the generator, I will write a generator here. So there will be a generator index here. So this is called an anomaly function. And this anomaly function should go to zero, otherwise, the, the symmetry is not conserved at the quantum level. The symmetry is not conserved at the quantum level, and so you will make sure that the theory is not. The symmetry is not conserved at the quantum level. Theory is not an opposite. So, for a consistent quantum field theory, the symmetry should be conserved at the quantum level. Okay? <coughs> and so, you need these anomalies to be actually cancelled. One can write a general form for this anomaly function. Uh, there is a very, very, very fantastic uh, Review by Villar on anomalies. Okay, it's called lectures on anomalies. If I remember correctly, and of course there is a famous book by ABJ. There is a book called ABJ, anomalies, sources, and everything. Okay. It's a two-volume book, but. I advise you guys to read this anomaly. Um, this is very good. I lectures on anomalies is on available on archive. So the anomaly function for a generator uh, of any symmetry, say for example for an abelian or non abelian symmetry, some generate R will turn out actually using some path integral methods and everything. <coughs> Some 16 by square, some representation trace f at the which is something called a topological factor. Which will end up being some, some topological factor. It is it is just dependent upon some. So these anomalies should cancel. Otherwise, what happens is your currents will not be conserved, your or equality, your slab log Taylor identities will not be conserved. Okay? You can re express this in terms of the slab log or del by del uh, W times, you know, in terms of the path integral, you can write to your slab log Taylor identity. So now that I have impressed upon you that these anomalies should cancel, how many anomalies are there in standard model? So how many triangle diagrams if you want? 
these are actually nicely listed in this image shown and I think they are 10 of them. Okay. So every time you modify your standard model, if you modify your standard model, you should make sure that uh, these anomalies are cancelled in the new field. Okay? So you have, so the, the diagrams are, all of them can be expressed nicely in terms of this triangle diagrams. So these are essentially, so putting u1, 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 which is called the u1 cube anomaly. It's also called the u1 cube anomaly. It is just an algebraic expression in terms of uh, the hypercharges. It's a cubic equation. So nowadays you find people trying to solve these Dijkhoff equations with uh, all kinds of new things actually. So sometimes if, if you want, uh, have you guys write that paper called number theory dark matter? No. Okay. Read it. It is deals with if dark matter has an extra U1 symmetry, say for example. Okay? How do you cancel the anomalies? And so you had to cancel these kind of anomaly conditions with an extra U1. And then you solve this because uh, it's a cubic equation and it turns out that these all these charges should be always integer charges or fractional charges. So if you, if you want integer charges, you Need to, these are called Diffontian equations in mathematics, and so you use some number theory explanations and try to get something. Okay. Anyway, so it's so all the kind of things uh, which we are also interested in. Okay. Then SU2 U1. U1 SU2 SU2 U1 you can normally what you do is you remember them as like this SU2 U1 square SU2 square U1 so and so then SU2 Q <coughs> so and so then SU3, SU2, all these combinations you can have. You don't have SU3 Q, that's what I mentioned. Okay? So, you want, you want, uh, then similarly with SU3, take the combination SU3, U1 square, SU2, SU3. U1 and so on and so So this will give you uh, some combination because these are three of them, three gauge groups. So three, three cube, uh, three, uh, three, three, three combinations each. So you get nine equations essentially. This will give you nine equations. So there are these nine anomaly conditions. The last one goes under the name as gravitational anomalies. So if you Couple the standard model to a light graviton, which will be HP. Okay. You will have another anomaly. So, so sometimes called the Witten anomaly. Yes, there are several Witten anomalies. So I should be careful with actually this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So these are the 10 anomaly conditions which are in standard model, which have to be satisfied. And the standard model particle content is such that it satisfies this. So making sure that it's renounceable even at the quantum level and the particle content is that, such that. Okay, theoretically, okay, you are making the theory is renounceable. So does it have any practical applications? I mean, are there any places where you can think that if I don't add the anomaly contribution or something, okay, which will uh, uh, 
the results will be modified essentially. So these figures are there in Pascal and Schroeder, so you can just have it. So S actually, say for example, if you are having uh, in PP bar collisions, say for example, or PP collisions, if you have a W boson production or something, and if you start computing, uh, the, say QCD corrections to them. So there are various places the same set of diagrams appear essentially, that in this triangle the diagrams appear, okay, Higgs to gamma gamma, so for example, the calculation of the Higgs to gamma gamma is very much like, exactly, almost exactly like the rounding aspect of triangle diagram. So the Higgs discovery channel is very similar. Anomaly calibration. Okay. So, if you work in RZ gauges or other unitary gauge, you, yeah, yeah, there are some controversies about it, essentially, which are non controversies, actually. Let's just take uh, another example where anomalies do play an important role. Like for example, you have quark and gluon, say a PP bar collision, PP collision. So if you have a diagram, you can have a diagram. If one of the vertices is a uh, vector boson, say for example. Vector boson production at hadronic collaborators. So you have diagrams like this type. So you say you start with a quark and then you have a gluon. Then you have a triangle diagram. And then this could be some vector boson. This is exactly the anomaly. Okay. <coughs> so similar kind of diagrams you can have. Uh, okay. So this is like SU3, SU3, it could be U1 or SU3. Now, so happens that if you have these anomalies, you also have to make sure that you add all the three generations in the system. All the three generations in the loops of the fermion triangle. Okay? So you say that okay, my energy is not sufficient, I don't care about the virtual contributions. Say the virtual contributions top quark is very heavy, it will suppress for something if you say and if you don't tap the top quark mass or the top quark loops, say for example, it will never work out. It will not work out. Say for example, you cannot neglect anything. In fact, it has physical, say especially if you take the distributions of this, uh, say D sigma right, or in various distributions essentially. All the contributions have to be taken into consideration, all the generations, okay, and then make a physical difference in the shape of the distribution. Okay. So anomalies play a role. Physical process. When I say this thing, uh, 
I mean uh, physical process in the sense that uh, we had to take the anomaly contribution also in this kind of physical process such that you get uh, meaningful results and correct results at the end of the day. And they can actually, if you don't take this contribution, say for example, top or contribution to this or something, like that, the shape of the distribution will be completely different compared to what you get with that thing. So when you match with the exponent, you may be matching with the wrong results. So the theory, its calculation itself will not be consistent when you want to measure. Okay. So this is uh, this is essentially uh, analog analog calculation for vector boson production at atomic level. So now I think this was started in the late 80s. 878 or something, this calculation started. Nowadays, it's a very big problem. Okay. <coughs> so, so anomalies play a very, very important role. So, if you add a fourth generation, the anomalies cancel. If you exactly add exactly fourth generation, all heavy and everything, the anomalies cancel. So they cancel generation by generation. You make sure that you are consistent with the phenomenological conventions. You can add any n number of generations. Okay? But the generation should be such that the quantum assignments should be same, essentially, exactly like the first two generations. First thing. The first thing. So uh, this is all about. The first part of the lectures, okay. The first, uh, not even the first part, essentially the introduction to the lectures, which is essentially the recap of the standard. Okay, if you have not attempted your standard model course, this is your recap. So today I finished the recap. I, I think I finished almost all the recap, everything. So we will now start going for physics beyond standard. Okay. So we will start going. Uh, uh, as I said, everything I did in the recap uh, on standard model, so, uh, so far I introduced, was essentially uh, every point was useful. Every point I, uh, what you know, will be about the loop corrections, so everything I mentioned will be useful in building a successful physics model. That's the basic idea. So, why physics? Your standard. Why? Why this course? Why should we go? <laughs> okay. Any answers? A lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. So this is a, so. This is what I should have asked in the first lecture itself, but anyway. Yeah, why physics beyond standard? Anybody have any opinions? Yeah. Yeah, let the Daniel say something. Dark matter, okay. Okay, let me list the reasons. So, Ritaja says dark matter. Anybody says anything else? Neutrino huh? masses. Okay. Then? Nitro antimatter is okay. I don't know where this was, but I am putting it in there. Then? Pi says hierarchy problem. We'll discuss what it is. Cosmological constant. Okay. Okay. Constant. Strong CP. 
then actuarial growth of what actuarial growth of scalars uh, breakdown of unitary or uh, actuarial growth of scalars of high multiple uh, it's a really similar to this one so this is the same if you have large exposure yeah the Any other, any other reason? Why do you want to go to Stanford? Just for the heck of it. We have no other job to do. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you really believe that there is physics plus science? Yeah, almost everybody. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. All right. So that's hundred uh, percent result. Very good. Okay, so these are all good motivations, but let's go through them each of them. Okay, uh, one by one. So we list this, and if there are something else, we'll come to it. So the, today I'll uh, discuss one problem. Okay, we'll just go through these things one by one. Okay, one by one, we just go through these things. Why is this important? So today I wanted to bring. Uh, and then we'll come. I won't say much about Pascal has been constant, okay? I'll say some things. Strong CP problem, dark matter, neutral masses. Anyway, this also I'll address a little bit. And uh, matter antimatter symmetry, and so on. So, very soon. But let's uh, address this thing about Hara. Okay. So, what is Hara? So uh, let's put it first pedagogically. Okay. So we know that how many forces are there. So let's just say there are four forces. Okay. So four forces. But these four forces are not actually of the same strength. So let's look at that at the quantum level. Essentially, they are not really at the same level. So there are four hierarchical. So there is a hierarchy within the interactions. The interactions are not of the same strength essentially. Okay? So there is a hierarchy. So there are four forces, electromagnetic force, weak force, strong force, and let me call something called alpha G R or G neutral. So this is these three are so nuclear. So at the Fermi scale, essentially at the Fermi level or something, ground spot, Fermi scale, the weakest is the gravity scale. So the gravity sits at a scale, if you convert it into energy units or the length scales, these are the round of length scales, which will be important. Tempo minus or in terms of energy, because I am writing everything in natural units, it is 10 power 18. So, whereas these forces, say for example, so the weak force is around 10 power minus 70 centimeters. Okay, so this is around 100. G. Strong force is around the Fermi scale, so 100 mV. The electromagnetic force, okay, you don't really put a uh, scale to that, but anyway, <coughs> this two scale is associated with it, but it's even it's somewhere between these two, it's valid. Okay. It's massless. So if you plot the forces, because if 
you combine with peak and electromagnetic, they sit at the same scale of energy. So the moment you combine them. So the electromagnetic force at the pole is also at atomic level. So So if you combine it, it is around 100 G. We can. So this scales so are, uh, are associated with the quantum nature of this when the interactions appear. When the quantum nature of these interactions appear. So below the atomic, uh, well, scales much much larger than atomic scale. You don't care about Photons, you only care about electromagnetic waves. So, at the atomic scale, you have to start worrying about uh, around Armstrong, say, for example. Okay? At that scale, you have to worry about the photon structure, or really like a particle structure. So, if you put it in terms of scales, so this is around 10 to the power and this is just a huge. 16 orders of magnitude between the rest of the forces here. So this is called the hierarchy of the forces at the quantum level. So these are on G, and So let's. Now that we know this entire thing is explained by Stanley. This entire thing, I know from the atomic scale all the way up to say 100 GeV, hundreds of thousands of GeV. I know it's explained by Stanley. I have a theory which explains it. Okay. So this theory is called Stanley. So this is the standard model scale. I can replace everything in terms of the standard model scale. Okay. So I can forget about the atomic scales and everything. But still, this huge scale difference, will it have any impact to the theory? Can I renormalize the theory? Scale by scale, at any scale. So suppose if I run out by the standard model, whether such a heavy scale, the presence of such a heavy scale, will make <coughs> any impact at a scale at this level? The answer should be no. What you expect is that okay, this scale will not impact the physics at this scale. Say for example, anything that Atomic scale will not impact scales at say larger distance. At our level, okay, the way I'm standing, okay, I'm standing on. Uh, uh, you, you, you discuss it because I'm standing because of uh, on friction. Because uh, you won't say that there are atoms and electrons, electrons are repelling this electrons. Scale. If I want to do the calculations in that sense, it will never happen. So okay. So you say that that scale uh, physics at every scale is separated. At each scale, physics should not talk to the physics at a very, very deep level. Okay. So, but in standard model, uh, this process looks like it's violated. Looks like it's violated. Okay. This entire thing that this scale should not talk to this one will get one. So if one, how does it happen? It happens because of the presence of Higgs boson. The presence of the Higgs boson.
Now starting with this picture, now there are several ways of looking into it. I will look into it in every way. Okay, let's spend some time on it. Uh, one, this goes under the name Wilson and effective field theory. Right? Like you start with the standard model like Okay, this contains. Like, like I said, all the classical Lagrange, no? all the parts essentially. It also contains an SSB plus rest. Now, what you say is that when you normally uh, do renormalization in standard model, what do you do? Okay, uh, so or the collapse imaginary or any other renormalization, what we do is we actually compute. Uh, loop diagram and then you use dimensional equalization, identify and isolate the infinity and reabsorb all the physical parameters to it. Now in the Wilsonian theory, Wilson, so when you deny an effective Lagrangian also, you can do the same thing. <coughs> but there is something called the Wilsonian effective Lagrangian. The Wilson and effective Lagrangian is more motivated by statistical mechanics essentially. Okay? So in the Wilson and effective Lagrangian, so again the, the reason is because this system is very much like a statistical system, remember that. Because it's a many body system, it all collapses at the lowest energy state in a potential. Okay? And then it forms something uh, like a tunnel set. So the in the Wilson and effect reaction, the basic idea is you derive the one loop effect reaction by imposing a cutoff. By imposing a just a cutoff of the theory. So L effect reaction is E power I over X. Between the moment of scales, between the moment of scales up to a particular moment of scale, so this will be a moment of scale, you take out all the modes of the field, you expand them into four modes of the field, and you stop at a particular mode of the field when the momentum reaches, momentum reaches this lambda curve. Now the question is, when you derive this, you can derive this, actually you can derive this, uh, uh, I'll give you examples where this is step by step derived, and there's a textbook called the word or tom, it's called effective Lagrangian, so the standard model, you can look into it, essentially, okay, they, they, they derive it explicitly. When you derive this, now if you remember this part of the Lagrangian, uh, so this is also done in uh, in some form. This derivation is also done in this way. So how to derive the effective it's only effective direction? Uh, uh, now the point is when you derive the effective direction, there are terms in the Lagrangian. Which take the value of the lambda. Okay. In particular, in, in particular, the L effective will have essentially the mu square x square term is replaced by lambda square. It's replaced by lambda square. And all the other things can be absorbed with the lambda function. You can actually see why this happens because you actually write down the propagator for it and then cut the propagator and then the one loop effect reaction, you write the Wilson and effect reaction, the mass of the Higgs 
gets replaced by the cutoff. But do we need a cutoff? Is there a cutoff for this channel? Is it possible that the standard model is always valid at all scales up to infinity? Minus infinity, plus infinity, and forget about it. Is there a physical cutoff? Now, the argument is that there is a physical cutoff because there is quantum gravity on this. Okay? At a scale, okay, at around 10 power 18 GV or something, at a reduced flat scale, there is a new theory which comes over which is a quantum gravitational theory and if there is a quantum gravitational theory if there is a quantum gravitational theory you should derive your standard model as method to theory from that theory from that full theory so if that theory is valid at a scale which is lambda okay you will end up Having this kind of a problem. Okay? So the mu square will be replaced by lambda square. This was supposed to be proposed by Wilson and then Tufkin and all the great guys. You can actually read the paper by Susskind. But he introduced the word quadratic divergences, which made a mess. Okay. <laughs> he introduced the word. That paper, that was the first paper I read in my life. Let's I I won't utter the word quadratic divergences. Okay. Yeah. So it is divergent with uh, the large power of the line. Sir, uh, is this Ah, in, in Fermi theory, okay, but it's a very controlled theory because uh, in Fermi theory you don't have uh, scalars. That's the point. And uh, okay, if you have fermions, it doesn't happen. Why does it happen to you for the Higgs part? Okay, say for example, it doesn't happen in Fermi theory. It doesn't happen in QED also. QD also, if you write a method to Lagrangian from QD, starting with QD, it doesn't happen. Uh, that you can look at uh, a very nice article by Muriam, okay. he also does it, and then also by Judy Che also does it. Okay, on natural is Muriam. Okay, so QD doesn't happen because I get this also I mentioned in one of the previous lectures that all the corrections. To the fermion masses are proportional to themselves. Okay. For a scalar, the corrections are not there because scalar doesn't have any symmetry which protects its mass. There is no symmetry which protects the mass of the scalar. Yeah. Go to say something first. Actually, I want to ask a question. Okay. If we ignore gravity for now. Yeah. I'll come to that point. I'll just come to it. Yeah. Uh, is there any mo motivation for having um, a UV sector other than neutrino masses, natural neutrino masses? If you, okay, if you ignore gravity, and if you ignore uh, uh, neutrino masses, you want to ignore even neutrino masses also. No, I'm saying, but is there any motivation other than neutrino masses, natural neutrino masses? Uh, the only motivation comes, which is an indirect motivation, if you want to take it seriously, is from gauge coupling motivation. Yeah, okay, the unification. Unification. It's approximately in five AM standard. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's approximately that's less less rigorous because you know it's all the people say that they should uh, they may not precisely verify, but they are coming pretty close to each other. And that's the only motivation, really. <laughs> that's the only motivation. Yeah. Okay. They come pretty precise. There is no other indication. 
Okay. Now this is one way of looking at it, of the hierarchy problem. Now you may say there is uh, okay, there is the Wilson and Petrie theory actually. So let me come to the second way. It's the same thing again and again. I'll repeat it, but in different ways to convince you that there might be a hierarchy problem. Okay. famous paper by Buras and Tom in the 1980s essentially and then also uh, for a while more in the debate. This idea stems from the fact that uh, when you run the gauge couplings, this I have mentioned it in one of the previous lectures that when you compute the RG equations, when I introduce the beta functions and the RG equations, they seem to be Roughly, you will find at a scale there is some triangle here. So, on the back triangle, which is around a scale around 10 power 15 g, approximately. So the question is, so even at the weak scale, they may seem to be, there is some difference in the gauge coupling values, okay, they all seem to be very different and they will not be same. While running this alpha weak, uh, this is alpha strong, uh, uh, alpha strong, alpha <coughs> then they run along the way. Okay, they come. Alpha strong becomes weaker, alpha uh, aromatic actually becomes stronger with energy. It is opposite of the um, alpha strong. It doesn't have asymptotic freedom, it has, strong. It has asymptotic slavery if you want. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, in fact, if you ask the question when the alpha aromatic blows up, you get a scale around 10 power 1 and 185 or something. In a large scale. So, anyway, these things you will find at some scale. So, this led to the idea that there is some theory which is called a gramified theory. In fact, they were not exactly matched, but you can have theories, there are could be some very large theory which is with a very large gauge group, something called a pen model, in which the threshold corrections or corrections to the gauge couplings at that scale could be such that they can unify exactly. It could happen. Okay. Uh, there is a very famous paper by Wolfenstein and Lowera who showed that just threshold corrections of this model can, within the standard model, can unify the gauge couplings. It's very, very tight, but you can actually have exactly. So, we don't know what is there up, okay, at very high energies, we have no clue what it is there, but there could be some, some way that these gauge couplings are unified. So, there is some new theory, instead of quantum gravity, but there is some new theory which takes over, which is called granification. Suppose if you live in a granification theory, like a scene. So, SE5 is broken down spontaneously again. To SO3 times SO2. Now, 
but also this has to be broken very carefully such that these symmetries are still considered. The grand, grand, uh, grand implication is broken. Okay? When you do that, you typically introduce a hex in my joint and hexes in the parameter. Okay? We'll deal with them when we are dealing with grand implication. But right now I just want to So the argument goes like this. Like suppose I break this symmetry along the uh, along the diagonal of this uh, 24, essentially. That means it's an adjoint group. So you can write it in the matrix. You can write it. All the particles, all the particles of the scale of the gut scale will attain masses around that scale. Okay. Now everything is protected, like in standard model, gauge bosons are protected by gauge symmetry. Fermions are protected by chiral symmetries. So they all will not get any masses at the gut scale. But the X is not protected by any symmetry. Okay. How does it get a mass? How do you prevent it not getting a mass close to the gut scale? Because Everything will be proportional to the waves of these particles. Like in the standard model, if you break spontaneously, I mentioned it a number of times, right? It is soft breaking, no? Spontaneous symmetry breaking is always soft breaking. So every all the breaking effects will be proportional to the mass of the wave, essentially the wave of the standard model heat speed. When SC5 is broken, all the breaking effects will be proportional to the gut scale web. So the web of that thing would be around gut scale. M gut around 10 power 18, 15 G we say for example. So all the particles will get masses around 10. Okay. So but the fermions will remain massless, standard model fermions. But the gut gauge bosons will get masses around and that, okay. So the X and Y bosons, you will see this in our okay. If the X and Y bosons, the X say in the SU5 field, we get a masses around the cascade. So what stops the Higgs not getting a mass around the scale? Because Higgs doesn't have any symmetry. So what we do is something called a fine tuning. This is the advent of the word fine tuning. You fine tune the potential such that one part of the Higgs gets a mass around 100 G, uh, 100 G. Another part of the Higgs gets a mass around 10 power 15 G. So let me call the triplet mass as the m gut scale okay, is the remaining part. So the phi will get it doublet at a triplet under C5. Okay, the triplet will get a mass around and the doublet is the standard model takes is around 100 changes. So I will find you the potential parameter. I find you the potential parameter such that this is true at the classical level. But will it remain true at the quantum level? Because there is no symmetry which is protecting the Higgs mass at the quantum level. At the quantum level, this will not get remain true. Large radiative corrections in a theory, you take a concrete theory, this is the calculation which has been done by Boras and Take a concrete theory, a C5 theory, break it spontaneously, okay, and you fine tune your potential such that you get your everything correctly. Okay, now you do the one loop calculation. You do the one loop calculation, and in the one loop calculation, what happens is you will find because the potential, the 24 potential also talks to the primes and the things exist, there will be a tiny current. Uh, coupling between the uh, between the 
24, uh, pi pi bar 24 is a one copy is a message. Okay. <coughs> so the one loop corrections to the doublet push it back. Not productive by any symmetry or otherwise, what you have to do is you have to do again fine tuning on the one loop equity potential. You derive the full one loop equity potential, do further fine tuning. For this reason, they say there should be some symmetry. This is 